Hey folks, and welcome to the show. MLR kickoff is back, and before we get started, man down. Steinberg out. I haven't seen an upset like this since Buster Douglas over Iron Mike Tyson. But as everyone knows, you never leave the pantry bare. You always have a viable replacement waiting in the wings. They don't get any bigger and better than who we're bringing in. He's been waiting for five years to be doing this show. And finally, Aaron Castro, stats boy, steps up. Buddy, welcome. I've wanted this for so long. We finally got rid of Pete. <laughs> welcome. How you doing? Doing pretty good. You know, it's it's good to be out from behind the curtain, uh, plugging things. Uh, what is it? You know, I've been busy, as you know. Um, it's been about four and a half months being uh, full time on league staff. So it's been a uh, it's been a whirlwind, a uh, bit of a fire hose, pretty much every week. Um, and then you take that fire hose and then you put out fires yeah. um, once you get in season. So, Mate, uh, who starts the most fires in MLR ownership? Don't answer that. Aaron. <laughs> no comments. No comment. That's the way to oh. do it. Well, you're always, you're always watching the games anyway. Now you're working for the league. You, you're wearing many hats for the league as well. Have you had a chance to actually sit back and enjoy any of the rugby this year or has it all been work, work, work? Uh, I think it's – I mean, I've watched a bit of the Six Nations since obviously I'm a nut. When it comes to just – when you live this, you kind of have to plug – take the plug out and uh, go away from rugby, right? Um, when you're, when you're doing it. So I have enjoyed some of the rugby, um, but when you, I think we have 112 games this year and I have to watch all 112. So it's, uh, for as enjoyable as this job can be, um, it, it's still work. Have you, have you done the math? 112 times 80. And oh no, no, don't, don't. <laughs> Oh man! Uh, by sixty, to to, how many hours you put in? I had to. Life. I had to say thanks to Brooke um, on Twitter because, in the most affectionate way, she is. She's a rugby widow, um, and has like hung on um, and let me do this thing for basically five years. So, and and we're we're in a good spot um, going forward, especially with how the league is going. So. You're the best, Brooke. We appreciate it. Thanks for letting us borrow him once a week as well. I know he's busy and you probably, the last thing she wants to hear is like, hey, I have another rugby project I'm doing. I'm going to do a podcast with these two weirdos. It's going to be great. But as you can see, I've got the, uh, the, the Houston Sabercats polo on tonight. So uh, shout out to our friends down there in Houston because we've got a special guest joining us later, Emmanuel Albert, the second overall pick and uh, the second ever uh second overall pick in the 2021 draft. Is it 2021? What year is it? I'm so confused with COVID. Yeah. 2021 draft. We were together then in Austin when he got picked. Uh, Pete has been kind enough to record a few segments for us. So for those who just watched the show for the professor, all three of you, don't worry. He's still involved tonight. So no big deal. But Aaron, now I've got the chance to, to grill you a little bit. Uh, who's oh, wow. been the biggest surprise packet for you so far in MLR? Um, individually or team wise? Team wise, B- best surprise. We're going to be positive. Um, so what's been the best surprise out of all the teams this year? I think the biggest thing is when you look at um how consistent team rosters are, and then how uh, inconsistent I guess some of the coaching rosters are. Um, it was always going to be interesting if New England was going to be able to make the next step. Um, they are now second in the Eastern Conference, and they are likely making that next step. Uh, the faltering surprise a little bit is um, it is LA a little bit, but as you know, uh, they're they're pretty banged up. Like they've lost a bunch of guys for the season. They've lost a, they're, they're, they've got a bunch of injuries that are going to hold guys out for uh a majority of the rest of the season they'll come back towards the end so it's been um a bit of a struggle for for them they're still really competitive you've got a lot of veterans um that are tend to be durable so they will be just based on where they are i I think they will still challenge in the west but it, it will be a tough road for them um look at the fight that dallas has had pretty much every week 
Like they, yeah. I mean, we wondered uh, you and Pete and I sort of how they would go after their first game. And, you, you know, it, it, in some sense, it reminded us of Austin in, in 2019, but you're just seeing something that's, they fight very hard. And for, for as much tumultuous events have occurred, like their, their coach didn't get a visa. So they separated um, that relationship and they went with their assistant and their GM and their senior players to sort of cobble it together. And, it, and for as difficult as their time has been and as close as they have been to getting a, their first win, they're still in very high spirits, even though it can get you down when you go on a skid. Yeah. I love the fact that you just used the word tumultuous and Pete's never used that. So that's awesome. You are ticking boxes here, brother. I love it. But I did say the professor would have a role to play. So let's bring him in. He was uh, fortunate to, to get a little window of time earlier today to pre-record this for us as he dived into the game of the week from last week. So let's listen in to the professor now. Our deep dive from last week's game is the LA Geek Giltinis hosting the Utah Warriors. And this was a really interesting game. Obviously, the two teams that made the playoffs last year. And interestingly, Utah won this game using a little bit of the LA Giltinis from Magic from 2021. If we remember, the Giltinis could score from anywhere. They did not need much possession. All they could do is they would open you up and they would score from 40 yards, 50 yards, 60 yards. And that's how they were, and, and they would score three tries. That's in fact what they did in the final is they scored three tries in I think about 10 minutes against ATL, all from long distance. But this is a different Giltini. Playing with their fourth fly half, they find it very, very difficult to score. So if you have a look, you can say, hey, it's three tries each. Um, and you would say, all right, that looks pretty even. Um, but when you actually look at it, you say, the Giltinis had 204 passes to 97 passes by the Utah Warriors. They had um, 129 breakdowns to the Utah Warriors 62. The Utah Warriors had 269 tackles. And when you see a tackle count that high, what you're really seeing is you're seeing a team that's near the line. And hold on, folks, because we're going to learn a little bit more about this later. But the team that's near the line not being able to get the ball over the line without a lot of phases. Their forwards have to carry it a lot. They've got to pick and go, pick and go, pick and go. Those are all tackles that are made, but they're not difficult tackles to make. And so it was both the um, attack, the efficiency of the attack of Utah, but also the defense. Their ability to hold out near the line that won this game for Utah. This was a real important game for Utah. It puts them back up in the playoff hunt. They're going to be feeling good about it. And the Giltinis need a solution. They need to work out how to score tries. Their lineouts were phenomenal last year, not as good this year. They were great in scoring from lineouts. More than 50% of their tries were scored from lineouts last year. Not the same LA Giltinis. And now teams will go to the LA Coliseum and they'll feel like they can win. Let's get your thoughts on that one, Aaron. What did you think last week of that performance? You know, it, it was interesting. You look at sort of the injuries that, that both teams have and you're wondering what's going forward because the back line specifically for uh, Utah has basically taken six rounds to get settled. Um, they've interchanged their, their fly half every week up until week five i think so like we're we're finally getting some consistency i think niall saunders has has sort of come on they had a full-on like you know exodus of scrum house um which which pretty much hurt them and then if you look at uh la taz smith uh i think he's about he's 20 years old uh had to start um at nine with uh harrison goddard out um, and he did pretty well. He's also U.S. qualified, so that's really cool. Yeah. Um, and um, some some deci- I mean, we chatted about it. Some decisions in the game were were a bit tough. I was uh, wanting uh, really 
LA to take the points when they had that penalty and, and take the restart. I know why they, they attempted to continue pushing because they, it looked like they were going to get through, but ended up, uh, you know, yielding um, more points to, to Utah mm-hmm. in the end. Yeah, it was interesting. I tell you what, Saunders interview afterwards, he was a chipper bloke for just smashed out 80 minutes. Uh, loved his enthusiasm. So more of that. But yeah, good to see Utah bounce back, get a little revenge for that Western Conference loss. I uh, know it probably doesn't make it feel any better, but uh, good to see them kind of steady the ship. But yeah, it'd be interesting next couple of weeks in LA because they do have uh, quite a roster sitting on the sidelines, and if they can get healthy, they can go on a run, but they may leave it too late here if uh, they don't start winning a game or two on the run in. All right, mates, uh, we talked a little bit about draft. We talked Houston. Uh, we were very, very fortunate now to welcome in a special guest. Made his debut two weeks ago, backed it up against Seattle as he's on his road back from some shoulder surgery, but really high, really high on this young fellow out of Lindenwood University. Uh, let's bring him in, Emmanuel Albert from the Houston Sabercats. And joining me now is Houston Sabercat back rower, Emmanuel Albert. Emmanuel, thanks for joining the show. And uh, firstly, congratulations. You made your debut two weeks ago now and then backed up against Seattle. How was your first taste of Major League Rugby action? Uh, thanks for having me on the show tonight. I appreciate it. Um, you know, Going out in the game, I was nervous at first, but getting um, getting a run out with the boys, it felt really well. It felt good. The pace is definitely way faster than what I was used to back in college, but I uh, felt really prepared going into it. Let's jump back. Let's go back even further than college. We'll get to Lindenwood in a second. Grow up in Minnesota. Egan, Minnesota of all places. Everyone's going to have to get on the old Google Maps right now to find where that is. That's where your rugby journey began at high school, right? Yes. Tell us a little bit about that. What was it like playing high school rugby in the frozen tundra of uh, Minnesota? <laughs> well, um, Minnesota, we only play rugby in the in the spring, and so like spring probably hits around April. So when we're trying to practice and everything, we had to do it in gyms because there's too much snow on the ground. But luckily, like once it like starts getting up with the weather and it's warm outside, it's actually pretty fun. We got to travel around to. Um, like local states like Wisconsin or uh, Indiana for some tournaments and play against other teams as well. So it was just, um, it was a great experience. So how do you get yourself on the radar of Josh Macy and the Lindenwood Lions program down there in Missouri? Um, so my junior year of high school, I played uh, in a rugby tournament, um, the Colorado tournament where they do like all, all state teams. So I was playing with um, Minnesota, and in one of the games, the Linwood Belleville coach actually uh, came and recruited me. He saw me play, and he thought I did a really good job, and he said, like, they would like me to come there. And so I only heard about Linwood through my friend's dad before, and me thinking that was um, the Linwood St. Charles, I was going to register, but my friend's dad told me that I should – try to reach out to this guy, Josh Macy, like this is the school that you should go to. And from then on, I just sent him an email, sent him some clips and like, hopefully he liked what he liked and it ended up working out. Well, it turns out he did like what he liked and he liked you because he brought you down there. You turn up into Lindenwood program, which is is now probably one of the more dominant college rugby programs in the U.S. Its representation across MLA, as you know, is quite wide. One of your former teammates there, Mike DeWall, over at Austin, he had a lot to say when you came in in terms of just this raw talent. And that was kind of the stigma that followed you there. Over your time at Lindenwood, you left as a polished rugby player. Tell us a little bit about your journey at Lindenwood, some of the coaches and players that you worked with to kind of complete your game from high school you know, prodigy talent into solid college player that would go on to become a professional. Right. So I was really like lucky enough to get there and just be blessed um, to have people like Michael Duvall or uh, Wes White, who's now playing in the UK and like Nick Feeks and Christian Rodriguez, all these people that are either playing pro now or playing the MLR overseas. They really like, they really helped me like develop my game, especially Wes and Duvall. I would always like be around them 
uh, they taught me like things like jumping in a line out because going from high school, I never did line outs at all. I was, I was just a guy in the back line, just taking a hit up. So like they really took me under their wing and helped me with that. And, um, they just saw that like the attitude I had going into it was really more of just like, I just wanted to work. Like I knew all these guys were better than me or like developed players and or bigger than me and it just didn't really matter to me as what they were as long as like i just kept pushing and i just thought like well if they're here and i can play with them then i can compete with them like at this age like who knows what can come from there and obviously during your college experience major league rugby blossoms uh and and grows you see some former teammates you mentioned fixie there um start doing really well in mlr at what point at lindenwood did you start watching MLR a little closer going, you know what? Not only do I want to do that, but I can do that. Uh, yeah. So uh, the MLR started around like my sophomore year in college. And I had um, like the NOLA head coach at the time was Nate Osborne. And I had known him because he is like, he coached Metropolis in Minnesota. Yeah. Yeah. That was a men's club team that I happened to play for like growing up. That also helped me really improve my game. Just I would go there and I'd be playing with all these grown men, and it just another reason that made me like want to work harder. And so I started following that, and I was a big Nola fan because of Nate Osborne, just watching them play, and um, I was always rooting for them. And then when Feast, obviously, he got drafted and he went there as well, um, it was just like a big part for me to like support them. So been watching major league rugby since the start of it actually yeah apologies for some of those early games uh <laughs> as well it was a bit rough for me to call him as it was to watch him play no all right let's go forward now draft day is coming up it's it's a it's one of the weirder ones right we're coming out of like this covid shutdown from 2020 college rugby's non-existent how was the process for you not having recent game film? What did you put together and what was your communication like with some of the coaches around the league? Well, um, again, like I just talked to one of my coaches at the time, uh, Coach Jimmy, Jimmy Harrison, and he helped me come up with some film I could put in. And since our junior year kind of got cut short, I didn't really have that many games from like um, – playing at varsity or like the top level in college rugby because I only played I started playing varsity my sophomore year but I was like luckily to put some good film I had enough to make it like a good highlight tape put it together and then um along with like what was going on with the Rudy Scholes awards stuff that really helped like my image or just like a lot of noise I guess around me because everybody was like looking at that or like draft or like coaches would be looking at that. So that helped um, get my name out there as well. And talking to some of the coaches, it, it was either they just reached out to me through um, email or message on social media. And, or if I saw them at a tournament, cause I was playing sevens over the summer, I like happened to run into them and we would just chat or they would, you know, like video conferences. But, um, it was a really, it was a really great experience. Like, I would never have thought that something like that would happen, especially in like rugby in America, because just watching football and like other sports, that seems like it's where it's at. It's more big in those aspects, but it was a really great experience. Now, I had you with an extremely high draft grade. I had you like one of my top players going into the draft, which normally would be the kiss of death. But somehow you overcame the damn power curse. You go second overall to Houston. First, you've got to take the Tom Brady philosophy here and make Dallas pay for the next 10 years, smash them every time you play them <laughs> for passing on you. But when did you know that Houston were interested? And then how how was that experience on the day, like waiting for that phone call to come through and, and find out you'd been picked second overall to Houston? Um. So... Going into, like, the summer, I had some friends that was, like, talking to Houston, and I didn't know really what was going on with that. Like, I just let coaches, like, again, like, reach out to me or um, my agent at the time. But it wasn't until, I would say, like, a week before the draft that I actually had um, a one-on-one with 
the director of rugby, like Hanukkah Mayer, and he called me and he we had a chat on the phone and we just talked about like what like what I'm looking for because at that point in time I didn't really know where I wanted to go either. Like Nola was a one of the places I would like to go, and Utah was another place, but it was still just up in the air for me. So. Um, when I sat down and had a conversation with him and he had talked to some of my uh, friends that I went to school with and just like learned more about me. Um, yeah, he just really made me feel like this was a place that I would want to come to and like I would feel comfortable coming and working like especially under him and Coach Poita. It was just like an unreal experience that like not many people would get in a lifetime. So especially how they just embraced me and made me feel like at home. And during the draft, they even came up to Austin to come and, like, greet me and meet me face-to-face. So um, it was just, yeah, it was a great experience, and I was just happy that they were able to do those things for me. You got the full Texas experience. I remember you leaving uh, in JT's pickup truck. (laughs) Yeah. He's a big old cowboy hat on. He's like, look, he's already in Houston. He's ready to rock and roll. But (laughs) – how was it getting to Houston? Obviously, it's a it was a big turnover, right? Like Houston uh, have struggled uh, since they've come into the league in year one. They've, they've underperformed and underachieved for numerous reasons, and that's why they had the pick that they had. Um, how was it stepping in, knowing that well, I've got this guy who's coached arguably one of the best teams in the world in Heineken Mayer coming in, um, an influx of talent coming from overseas. What what were you thinking, like going to Houston for the first time? Um, like again, like I said, um, and like you said, Houston did have a bad record, like going in from like previous seasons and everything. But for me, and I'm sure for everybody on the team and like the coaches and the people coming, it wasn't about what was done in the past. Everybody was coming to the team trying to build and focus on what we can do and like what culture we can bring this year for the team. So especially me, like seeing all the people that was drafted, I was really excited or just being able to, you know, like meet all these people and have a competitive atmosphere. It was really a great, um, just a great feeling. So I think that everybody coming in was excited to just make a name for themselves and make a new name for Houston. Yeah. Who, who have you gravitated towards in the team? Where, where's your, your close bonds early on, the players that you're uh, hanging around with the most? <laughs> um, I would say I usually I hang out with a lot of the rookies. There's a couple of rookies there, like Jordan Jackson. Um, he's from Florida. I hang out with him. He's a center. I hang out with um, one of my teammates. He's actually my roommate from college, Tanache. Um, we usually work out together, get along together. But um, a lot of the older guys that I'd hang out and talk to as well would be, like, Malon Aljabori. Um, he just came in recently, mm-hmm. kind of, like, messing around with him, just get some things that he can help me with on my game. Same thing with uh, CC Mahoney, and Billy Britz. I asked them a lot because, especially Billy, because he's a veteran player. He's been playing for a while, and, you know, he's had the <clears throat> luxury to play overseas and, He's a very talented player and knows a lot. So I just ask and nitpick, like, what can I do to um, better myself and, like, help the team as well. Yeah. So when it's all said and done, and hopefully it's a long time from now, what do you want your MLR and your rugby career to, to involve? What are some of your goals in, in your career that you want to tick those boxes before you finish up? Um, well, for me... Uh, I just want to just keep, like, for my goals, I just want to keep getting better and keep improving uh, in a rugby aspect. I don't really, I'm not looking to win any awards or anything for rugby or, like, be, like, oh, like, this guy's, like, rookie of the year or anything like that. I'm not looking to chase after any of those things. Um, I would just want to keep getting better and, For the team and for this year, I would want to win the championship, especially like that's one thing that I want for like the team. That would be a good thing that we can do. And that's what I think we're building on to this year. And we have the talent to do so. But for myself, 
I would say like some goals. I just want to be able to make USA squad, play for USA, um, play in a World Cup in 15s. Eventually, if I had the opportunity, play overseas, whether it's in France or New Zealand or England, just be able to travel and play overseas and keep testing myself um, against different styles of rugby and different players across the world. Yeah, I got a feeling you're going to tick a lot of those boxes, buddy, during your career. So uh, I, for one, super excited. I know you're just two weeks in and coming back from some uh, some shoulder surgery. So the, the ramp up is going to be pretty significant here in the next few weeks for you. But appreciate you again coming on the show. Uh, really excited to see the rest of the season and what you can do down there in Houston, Emmanuel. Oh, thank you. I appreciate you guys having me on tonight. There we go. Emmanuel Albert from the Houston Saber Cats joining us here on MLR Kickoff. There you go. And, and Pete, oh, there's Pete. one done. Wow. Sorry, Aaron. Pete. Oh. Oh, oh, it's just, <laughs> it's oh. amazing the bad habits I get myself into sometimes. It, uh, these are the stories we need to hear more of. High school rugby, into college rugby, into pro rugby. That's the pathway. I honestly think the ceiling. Now, was he as polished as some of the players in the draft? Definitely not. Is his ceiling higher? Absolutely. And I think with that coaching staff down there around some of those experienced players, the best for Emmanuel Albert is probably about two years away, but it could be special. Yeah, he's he's got and he's got a story. Like, you know, we, we got a little bit of it from Danny Wexelman's interview uh from from the draft. You know, his his mom's basically his hero. Like she's done a lot to make sure, you know, effectively the kids always got fed. And we're able to grow up in as a supportive a household as possible, even though times were times were tough. And then he got to, you know, go down to Lindenwood, even though I guess most of his college experience kind of got shuttered with, um, I guess, the COVID era as we sort of exit into an endemic period. But um, he, he's got a great head on his shoulders. Um, he's pretty durable other than, I guess, you, know, you get sh- shoulder surgery and he's got a great frame that, you know, I, I think that the coaching staff down there will will use quite effectively uh, on the field, and and he's also got this stable of back row players mm-hmm. that he gets to learn from because not every young player um, ends up in, in that uh, in that kind of environment where they are a sponge but have people to learn from, and so yeah, I if things go well for him. Um, you know, we could, I, I'm not sure we'll see an Andrew Guerra because the back row stable is very um, tight right now for the Eagles. But two years from now, he could be, you know, in that World Cup squad, um, you know, because that's what he wants to do. And he, he's strong enough and fit enough that he just needs to start getting his wheels under. Yeah, could be crazy. You, you almost think 23 might be too soon. I, I agree with you there, but... And I'd have 2027 circled on my calendar if I was Emmanuel Albert and be like, that's 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 me right there. Uh, okay, let's uh, let's move on. If, if this is a part of the show where if you want to take a nap, go get a cup of tea, a cup of coffee, change the laundry, Professor's Rugby Breakdown. It's 101 with Pete. Pre-recorded. Thank God. I don't have to sit here and listen to it this time, but I'm not sure what the subject is, but it's Pete Steinberg, so it's going to be enthralling. Run the tape, Gins. Let's listen to Pete. As we discussed earlier in the show, getting over the goal line is really difficult, and it was something the LL Giltinis were unable to do against the Utah Warriors. Why is it so hard to get over that last meter or two when you're near the opposition try line? And there's a couple of reasons for that. First of all, you don't have any depth. So when the forwards are taking the ball, they're not running hard, right? They're normally taking a step or two before they're being hit. So there's no space in front of the ball carrier to get momentum going. The second thing is there's no space behind the line. Kicking isn't really an option, and so the wings and fullbacks are up in the line, and so that makes it very, very difficult. There are more defenders in the defensive line. So how do you score? Well, first of all, you have to be very, very what's called accurate at the breakdown. That means you have to have low body height to be able to control the contact. You have to be able to move the ball back and present it back towards your team. And while it looks like there's a huge mess there, actually the ball carry is working to get that ball back and make it available. 
if you are lucky, you might find along the edge of the ruck a defender not paying attention, and you might be able to get over the line. But the great teams, what they do is they use their forwards not to score, but to actually create space out wide. They'll take it through many phases. The forwards will take it up again and again and again with the goal of sucking in defenders to create that space wide. And you can attack that space with a good pass or you can attack that space with a great kick. But it's all about attacking the space that the forwards have created. So when you see those backs score those tries or you see those backs in the stats scoring those tries, just remember that when you're near the line, almost every try is really earned by the forwards. There you go. I don't know about you. I did my whites, colours, and folded a load of laundry uh, while he just went on there, Aaron. Um, well, I don't he, know how you do it. He talked about the difficulties of getting over the try line with and with the rule change uh, this year by World Rugby, where if you get held up, the defending team gets a free kick. It, it changes the dynamics a lot. A little line dropout, isn't it? Line yeah, dropout yeah, time. Yeah, yeah. We've seen some classics already. Uh, yeah, that I think they'll tweak that again. That that rule because it's kind of interesting. But who knows? It's hard to get over because there's 15 people trying to stop you getting over, Pete. Like, why do you have to complicate simple yeah, stuff? Me, anyway, Pete. anyway, let's move on. Let's preview this round because it's going to be a great round. We're going to do a deep dive, Aaron, into our game of the week, which is going to be New England versus Austin. Um, That sets up for a really good game later in the weekend. But let's kick things off Saturday. It's going to be 4.30 Eastern on the Rugby Network. Toronto on the road, coming off that loss in New England, taking on the Utah Warriors. who are on a two-game win streak at the moment, and they get to go back to Harriman into that stadium. What, they put 4,300 fans in there last time? Uh, Weather meant to be good this weekend in Utah, so it could be a bigger number than that, Aaron. What are you thinking here? Uh, I think Utah's on a high. They finally got their head. Actually, because you're a league employee, I probably Uh, shouldn't set you up for failure here. I don't know. Um, Utah's on on a high. They just went back into the Coliseum, got some vengeance. Uh, Their halfback pairing settled. Uh, They're they're, the tight five. Well, actually, their whole pack is really settled. Uh, I, I think you're you're going to see a run from, from Utah, whereas uh, Toronto, again, is, is is struggling a little bit. So um, although if, if Toronto can get this over, if, if they can go into into Zion's bank and, and do something, it really says a lot because we, we weren't really sure about what Utah's record said. We were pretty sure they were still good, even though they had a tough schedule and were had three losses. But – I think what we're seeing is a team starting to to form up into his own. But if Toronto can go in there and sneak one, that sets up the rest of their season. Yeah. Toronto went in there a couple of years. I think it was 2019 and absolutely spanked them, put 60 on them. So uh, they're not uh, afraid to play at altitude there in Utah. So we'll have to wait and see. No predictions from you. I don't want you getting in trouble here. Like when Toronto gets six players suspended, <laughs> you know, Bill Webb and Mark Winnicker are like, ah, oh, Aaron, he had it out for us. So uh, I, I will say the Warriors, though, will get the win here at home, continuing on their winning ways against the Arrows. Moving on, New York at NOLA on Saturday night on the Rugby Network. This one down in the gold mine. Well, NOLA come out of a win over Dallas by the skin of their teeth, literally. I turned that on. And it was, I think I actually, I checked on Super Brew and it had me with the win and the points. I had Nola by 23 and I'm like, oh, I'm home here. Oh, man. And then you text me and I'm, you're like, Dallas is going to win this game. I'm like, what game is he watching? You know, they were getting blown out and I'm sure enough, it was a three-point game. When yeah. I turned it on. I'm like, oh, no. Nola, hang on, though. Yeah. Uh, Aaron, I, th- I think New York, after that three-point win against San Diego, will go down there and, and put the – put the screws to New Orleans side. Yeah, I, I, I think there's a, a, a bit of struggle. I, not, I, I, was, I wasn't expecting this because I thought this roster was mostly settled except for sort of the, the, back, the halfback pairing. Um, when you look at this, because it's a lot of guys that have had a lot of caps in the, in the gold shirt. But, um, you know, at, at the end of the day, when you have a tremendous amount of coaching change, um, because they have a – other than Kane Thompson, who was an assistant last year, and I know Taylor Howden is is familiar, but this is his first year as a coach for them. 
and then you get Carlos Spencer. But I, I think they're they're starting to settle King, down. King Carlos. The king. king he earned the title. You were king, called the King. king. Yeah. And then they get the king, right? So I think that they're they're settling down, but I think generally um, New York will be buffeted by this win, and and it'll be close. But I'll, I'll give it, it, it's it's a hard pick. Do does Nola rise on the back of their two uh, tight wins, um, or does um, you know, New York sort of waffle because they had that bad loss to New England the week before. So, yeah, I, no, I think they'll get it done. Good, good questions, though. All right, uh, moving on. Uh, this game has moved to Saturday now. It's going to be San Diego at LA in the Coliseum on the Rugby Network. Oh, this is a this this is a really tough game for LA, Aaron. I don't I don't know if they've got a yeah. path to victory here if they're not healthy or healthier. Yeah, uh, you know, San Diego, tough loss in New York, but they're having a pretty good season. I think they're pretty – they're back on the right foot uh, of where they want to be as a team that, you know, was in the final uh, three years ago and was odds-on favorite at the league cancellation in 2020 to probably win it all because they were – they're 5-0 and and dominant. Uh, Obviously, last year was a bit of an offseason, but – uh, solid coaching staff and good recruitment and some of their players have just come in um, so I think they had a few players uh, that had to play this weekend that legitimately I think showed up on Tuesday um, and uh, I you know it, it was a it was a tough one but Los Angeles uh, they got more banged up in that game against Utah mm. so it's uh, for as difficult as the Coliseum is to play, um, I don't know. Like it, it could be if they are able to salvage. Yeah, they, they need to win a couple of games unhealthy. I agree with you. Uh, this would be a roster decision. I've got to see who's playing, who's available for LA. If Goddard's back, uh, it helps a lot. Point of and, you know, a couple other players. I don't know how long-term those injuries are, but this, you'd have to favor San Diego as off right now in this one. All right, this, dude, this one could be an interesting one. Uh, also Saturday night, Seattle at Dallas on the Rugby Network. What are you thinking? I mean, da- Dallas has a lot of fight. They could win this of, game. A lot of fight. Seattle, uh, Seattle have looked pretty sad the last couple of weeks. Yeah, uh, it's you know, it's it's this one. I mean. If they just play a defensive game, I think one of the things that affected them against Houston is that they kicked too much and they did not play with the ball in hand a lot until um, the second half. And, and maybe that was just the dynamics of the game because Houston tend to kick a lot. I, I don't know what it is, but in in some sense, like the identity stays the same and they kicked away a lot of possession. But the difference was is where they were able to hold that possession. And Dallas is very dynamic. They find the gaps – um, when they shouldn't, and they just cut through. And you've got some uh, – and, and that's credit to, like, this team. I think, you know, the number eight, Conrad Arura, is really good. Um, they've got Adrian Carolsa, uh, who was that um, dynamic 10 and fly half for – or fullback uh, for Atlanta last year. So they've got pieces that can, can make teams run. Um, the question really is their defense. And – so is is Seattle's de- attack good enough to to get past that defense is really the question. Yeah, no, I'm going to pick an upset. I think Dallas is going to spring one on them here. Just a, a little feeling I have in the old guts. All right, Sunday is going to be our deep dive, New England, Austin. We'll get to that one in a second. Last game, ATL on the road, just up the highway, not too far away against Old Glory, who are coming off a bye. This one is 6 p.m. Eastern Sunday on FS1. What are you thinking here, Aaron? Uh, I, I think we've we, we've set up now the transition um, when it comes to stats. We didn't really know how how this transition went, and then obviously for for ATL, they they did very well in their first week, and then they had some stumbling blocks here and there. But uh, they just, you know, they they pretty much beat down um, Austin at home. It was at home. So, but uh, Old Glory's limping and they Mm -hmm. need to, I don't know if they need to win this game, uh, but they need to have a 
a good performance against this team because uh, ATL's looking on defense as good as they were last year. And on attack, they're, they've got everything that they were missing last year. Um, whereas Old Glory um, in spurts has had very good parts of defense and then very good parts of attack um, this season. But they've not put it together in any performance. Yeah, I've been really impressed with how consistent Rugby ATL have played to open this season. I did not see it coming, considering – Use that. give me that word again – tumultuous. Yes, how that off season <laughs> was for them. Uh, but they're winning. I think they'll continue winning to old glory, uh, rebuilding for 23. They're going to have to do some solid recruiting. They've got some really talented young, you know, American youngsters in that squad. So I think they're going to be better for this year. Very similar, you know, Peyton Manning, first year in Indy, got spanked, but went on and had a great career. So I think there's could be a little, little bit of Peyton Manning-esque with some of those young players in Old Glory getting their baptism of fire, so to speak. All right, let's deep dive. Austin, Free Jacks. This one is in Austin. Free Jacks, absolutely the hottest team in MLR right now because Austin lost in the weekend, who were the hottest <laughs> team in MLR. So now it's the, the former hottest versus the hottest. Backstreet Boys in sync. Who's coming up? Who's coming out? Or is it Brittany versus Christina? I don't know. More Brittany and Madonna, because Madonna was like up and then she was gone and then she did the whole MTV thing with Brittany. But I digress. Aaron, <laughs> give me your thoughts on this game. I think with Poland back, they have the inform nine uh, of the league of the past couple of years. I have liked Ryan Lawrence for, for Austin um, in some sense that the, the hinge pairing was a struggle for them last year and getting their attack um, going between whether it was Pele Cowley and Mac Mason, Pele Cowley and Will McGee, or, uh, you know, what was it? Ruben de Haas and Mac Mason, Ruben de Haas and Will McGee. Whereas this year we've got uh, a healthy Mac Mason and Ryan Lawrence has you know, played really well. Uh, one of the things that they were missing was um, the, the their, probably their best line-out jumper. Um, not the guy they throw to the most, but the guy who's always – contending in the air um, and stealing balls. I, I, I don't know if he had the most lineout steals. He definitely had the second or third most lineout steals in Isaac Ross last year. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and his just ability to stick that big hand out and take someone else's line out was, was very important for them. And that will be very important here. Um, but right now, I think Austin has the more dynamic finishers. Uh, on the edges. And we we did see Dom McKenna have to play six this week. Now, here's the thing. He's still this raw, talented ball carrier that if he gets into space, he's he's like an extra wing that finishes very hard on the left. Uh, and, and they have so you got two two guys with raw speed and that just finish and pump through collision in Aquina and Dominguez. And then you've got sort of a skillful, but still dynamic finisher in Mooneyham on, on the right wing. So it, it's, it's going to be a tough matchup. The question is how does Austin respond from their, from their game against Atlanta? Um, but this is the, they're now facing the meat of their schedule. This is they're facing the top two teams in the East back to back. Uh, and what does playing in the snow get you for for New England against Toronto, who's a bit who is a bit banged up, to be honest? Um, does does that prepare you for the intensity of this game? I don't know, but they are on the rise, um, mm -hmm. and it could be more beneficial for them to get that win than it was for uh, for Austin to go into a buzzsaw. Yeah, yeah, it is. It's it's a fascinating one because I kind of look at it as what they were able to do two weeks in a row in, in tough conditions, New England. You get them on a fast, dry track, does Boating Walker just tear Austin to shreds? Um, this That's front foot 10 in the league. Yeah. He's, he's, he's the best player in the league right now. Like, hands down. If, if you want to go and crown early season MVPs, it's him <laughs> and then Daylight. Um, <laughs> 
I do agree with you on Isaac Ross. I actually changed my pick on Superbrew from Austin to Atlanta when I saw Ross. He wasn't on the roster just because of how influential he is at the, at the line out. So if he's back, this game becomes very, very interesting. Um, if they don't have their targets, I think um, Luke Beecham's out for an extended period as well, which means another big body out of that pack for Austin. Austin, a little banged up too. You know, it's not like they've been uh, saved from the injury bug, but. This is this is a, this is a, they won't see each other until the championship, east and west. But hey, this this is a big game for both of them. Big game. I'm not even sure who to pick. I've got to see some rosters. Got to see some rosters here. Yeah, you you two just a nod. That's all I got from you. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I you know I you made sure I didn't pick any other games, so I, I think this will be. Uh, I kind of wish we had these a little bit more spaced out on Saturday night, but this will be the pit, the game that I will want to watch. Um, even though I'll have to watch three at the same time. <laughs> is this on? This is on. Oh, this is on Saturday night too. Yeah, it is. one game on Sunday. Yeah, mate. Do you know anyone at the league that can fix the schedule, Aaron? <laughs> Come on, we want Friday night footy back. Oh uh, yeah, I, I, dude. Friday night footy is great. Uh, Thursday night footy uh, that other week when we had, that was pretty fun too. We're, we're a couple of years away. The guys have to be all fully professional and and taken care of to make Thursday night football a thing. But we'll get there. Friday night footy we can do. That you've got to have the right matchups where you can make it. I'm trying to look if there's one that you could actually make it work. Maybe Atlanta and uh, Old Glory this week. Yeah, no, nah, the rest is – I think Toronto is fully professional. Get on a plane. Get them on a day early. Let's do Friday night footy again. All right, mate, let's wrap it up. Good show. I think we've got something special here. There's, there's some chemistry that I, I knew was going to be here but didn't realize it was going to be this explosive. Do we need Pete back? Maybe we should let know. the people decide. Do we, should we do it, put a poll up <laughs> after this drops? Do we let the professor come back? <laughs> Oh, uh, that, that'd be a good one. Yeah. You're not going to answer that one either. Are you? You're no, like a professional no. fence sitter now. I love it. <laughs> All right, bud. Final thoughts uh, straight from the league office. Final thoughts. Anything? Uh, it's it's been a good bunch of weeks. It's been a bit cold uh, across the entire profile. Uh, I think. This this whole last week, if if you go went from Atlanta all the way to New England and New York, it was something like twenty degrees colder than normal for every single for every single spot. Um, so, um, uh, p- predicting the weather is the is the thing that I will never try to do. It doesn't matter if you know, doesn't matter when the game is really. So uh, just. Make sure you go outside, take yeah. a look, see if the sun's up. It's what matters. Mate, plan, plan a golf trip somewhere and I can guarantee it'll rain. So if any team wants <laughs> rain, let me know. I'll plan a golf trip there and you can get some rain that day. Guaranteed. All right, Stats Boy, Aaron Castro wrapping it up for us. Beautiful stuff. Another episode of MLR kickoff in the bag to our producer and director. Well, he's also co-host this time, Aaron Castro, Ryan Ginty behind the scenes making the magic work, and to the former hardest working man in rugby media, Pete Steinberg, who decided just to mail this one in from Colorado. <laughs> just kidding. I hope uh, we, we'll give a shout out. We hope Elliot had a good birthday on the weekend too. He didn't have a show to do it. We'll do a birthday show next time. But this has been the MLR kickoff. I'm Dan Power. Thanks for tuning in.